Well, Cultaholic Faithful, we have done it again. After five dizzying and positively bonkers installments of pro wrestling road stories, we have gone to the well once more and dredged up ten, yes ten, more yarns about grapplers behaving badly and getting involved in unenviable situations on the road. After all, people like sequels, don't they? Hey, six screen movies so far, more than a dozen Halloweens, why can't we have six road story compilations? Besides, some of these are more frightening than old Ghostface anyway. The lure of the crazy pro wrestling road story is just how they can vary in tone. Some are so ridiculous that you question if the individuals involved are actually mature adults. Spoiler, adults yes, mature no, and some are so harrowing that you question how some of the principles involved have survived to this day. But whatever end of the spectrum the stories fall under, they indicate that in pro wrestling, the true high spots and insanity often take place away from the squared circle. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 more wild wrestling road stories that defy reality. Join us! Number 10. A Very Convincing Work If you've seen the 2010 Royal Rumble match, you might remember Chris Jericho sporting a bit of a shiner beneath his right eye. The source of that discoloration might just be an errant strike delivered days before the Rumble, though not from the actual match. Following a SmackDown taping in Cincinnati, Jericho, Shane Helms and Matt Hardy patronized a bar in the neighboring city of Erlinger, Kentucky. Things got a little frisky when Y2J and the Hurricane began aggressively playing fighting, but that's pretty normal behavior for a couple of fun-loving grapplers, right? What isn't normal is that Jericho and Helms were arrested shortly after the fact. After leaving the establishment, Jericho and Helms's brand of drunk foo apparently freaked out a cab driver outside, so much so that he called the police. A TMZ report even had it that a hazy helm struck several civilians in the cab. Nobody would press charges, so the most they could get Jericho and Helms on was public intoxication. According to Hardy, Beer Fogged Jericho, whose eye swelling hadn't fully set in yet, was arrested while leafing through a wrestling magazine in a nearby convenience store. Number 9. Keep on Trucking There are several variations of this particular tale. Some, like Eric Bischoff, have claimed that it was just a prank. Others, meanwhile, say it was a ridiculous way to handle personal business. The story in question involves Johnny Grunge, the less aerodynamic half of the public enemy, alongside Flyboy Rocco Rock. The table-breaking duo signed with WCW in early 1996, but public enemy's run in the big time nearly ended as fast as it began. That's because Johnny Grunge stole a truck. And not just any truck either, I am talking a WCW production truck. Bischoff recalls Grunge did it just to mess with veteran WCW staffer David Crockett, but ECW founder Todd Gordon, a longtime friend of Grunge, claims that the wrestler had an apparent ulterior motive. Turns out Grunge had arrived at the venue before picking up any narcotics and desperately needed his fix, so he borrowed company property to go make his score somewhere in town. To prank Grunge in return, WCW booker Dusty Rhodes had a fake cop confront Grunge the following day. When asked why he took the truck, Grunge apparently retorted, It ain't stealing if you bring it back, it's borrowing. Number 8. Fake This through the years, countless stories have emerged that all follow this same template. Wrestler hangs out in public place, brain-dead macho civilian tries to start a fight with him, and brain-dead macho civilian ends up in less than mint condition as a result of their bravado. Stupid bravado. Now, most of these moronic challenges are usually loudmouth jock sniffers whose athletic dreams never materialized, but not always. In fact, in Birmingham, England, one time in 2005, a sizable portion of WWE's roster was called out in a hotel lobby by a group of professional kickboxers. By all accounts, no matter what noun followed professional, the vocation didn't matter because the stars of WWE apparently kicked their asses anyway. Referee Mike Kyoda and longtime backstage staffer Bruce Pritchard relayed the details, and it began the way you would expect. Some apparently liquored up, testosterone filled fighters, apparently numbering more than a dozen, barked insults at the wrestlers, calling them fake and whatnot, and it descended into a mostly one sided beating led by Dave Batista himself. No Nobody on WWE's end was arrested, nor did the company punish them, and really, why would WWE punish anyone? Because if anything, they proved that kickboxing is far faker than wrestling is. Number 7. Gas-Powered Travel 
Wrestlers are used to traveling alone or with close friends when touring domestically. However, on international excursions, grapplers and staffers are usually confined to the same buses and all the time spent cramped together can lead to some obvious tensions. Former WCW ring announcer Gary Michael Capetta recalls the time World Championship Wrestling hit up England in late 1991 when most of the tour bus occupants directed their hostilities at one particular individual, Curtis Hughes, known on screen as Mr. Hughes, the imposing bodyguard of world champion Lex Luger. Funny thing is, Hughes may not have even been conscious at the time. During the 170-mile trip from London to Sheffield, Hughes, who was apparently passed out due to his, shall we say, indulgences, began emitting noxious gas loudly and with great frequency while in a slumped-over stupor. With nowhere to go and many miles left to travel, near-comatose Hughes continued gassing up the bus. It was apparently so bad that the Freebirds had to briefly remove the overhead hatch, believing frigid December air was more palatable than the air on the bus. Just as several wrestlers were thinking about lighting a match beneath Hughes, the monstrous wrestler was woken up and reprimanded. Number 6. Not loving it One of the most well-known arrests of a professional wrestler is also one of the most bizarre and would be totally farcical if not for some of the brutality involved. In the spring of 1984, ex-Olympic powerlifter and then AWA wrestler Ken Patera was between shows on the road and attempted to secure a late-night meal at a McDonald's in Waukesha, Wisconsin, only to arrive after the restaurant had closed. Patera was denied service, and what happened next has been disputed by the parties involved. Per the record, Patera apparently lifted a large rock and chucked it through the Mickey D's window. According to our man Ken, though, it wasn't him. He says at the time, he was denied service, a disgruntled employee threw the rock. Nonetheless, police were soon led to Patera's hotel room, where he and fellow heavyweight Masa Saito ended up brawling with the cops. It took around a dozen cops to subdue both men, and four officers had to be treated at the hospital after the fight. Both men were convicted of the assault, and each served less than two years in prison. And that, dear viewer, is why most McDonald's now offer 24-hour service. That or they realize potheads crave McNuggets in large quantities quantities at 3 in the morning. Number 5. A Near Lethal Encounter Usually in these videos, we genuflect at the altar of Haku, a man who sneezes liquid magma and uses live rattlesnakes as golf covers. This time around, we're going to spotlight a similarly dangerous warrior that anyone with more than two brain cells wouldn't dare cross, the lethal weapon, Steve Blackman. With his extensive martial arts background and steely demeanor, Blackman can ward off most individuals without having to lift a finger. Unless that individual is resident drunken knob-end JBL, who happens to spot Blackman at the Kansas City airport after an early morning flight. Ever the enterprising prankster, Bradshaw walked up to Blackman and began patting him on the rear just to irritate him. Blackman told him stop. Wash, rinse, repeat, and after Bradshaw did it a third time, Blackman started throwing hands like somebody mashing buttons on Mortal Kombat. A hungover JBL was no match for Blackman, who was getting ready to take Bradshaw's knees out, but his foot got caught in the handle of someone luggage. Several wrestlers separated the two as they and the bag probably saved Bradshaw from having his ACL severed. Two takeaways from this that you already knew, JBL is a total dick and don't mess with Steve Blackman. Number 4. Nasty Cuts the 1992 Royal Rumble is most memorable for Ric Flair's hour-long trek to the WWF title, but there's a lot of little minutia in the legendary match's foundation. Like, how come nasty boy Jerry Sags was in the match, but not Brian Nobbs? Well, the kayfabe reason for Nobbs' absence was that he suffered a shoulder injury, resulting in him having to miss the Rumble. Well, that might be partially true. Nobbs was certainly injured before the Rumble, but the primary reason for his absence was that he was nearly stabbed to death. Two weeks before the pay-per-view, after a WWF house show in Peoria, Illinois, Nobbs, Sags, and IRS were driving away from the venue when they were accosted by a group of young men in another vehicle. The youths reportedly threw items at them from their car and swerved across several lanes of traffic to cut the wrestlers off. Nobbs had exited the car to check for damage when he was attacked by one of the assailants, a 20-year-old man with a knife, and stabbed several times. Nobbs miraculously survived the ordeal and was back in the ring the week after the rumble, just 22 days after the stabbing. 
Number three, the juice is loose. It's another story involving international WCW travel, though what was inhaled in this one was more physically distressing than anything from Mr. Hughes's bowels. In the autumn of 2000, World Championship Wrestling hit up Australia for a spate of shows. Shortly after arrival, Juventu Guerrero of the Filthy Animals had reportedly gone to a club and ended up smoking something given to him by an unknown person. It was later believed that the item had been laced with PCP, as evidenced by Hoovy's actions the following morning. In the restaurant at the Marriott Hotel where the wrestlers were staying, Guerrero went into a full-blown drug-induced freakout. He tore his clothes off, screamed disturbing thoughts at the top of his lungs, and threw chairs while a horde of wrestlers and police officers tried to subdue the supercharged cruiserweight. It took a near eternity for those present to apprehend Guerrero, who was incredibly elusive while under the influence. Comically, at one juncture, a cop tried to mace Hoovy, who ducked the spray, causing another officer to catch the face full. However, the slapstick humor ends right about there as Guerrero was finally brought under control, arrested, and ultimately fired from WCW following the escapade. Number 2. Adrenaline! In my soul! Bloody wound that starts to flow! At the time of this video, Cody Rhodes is one of the most popular stars in all of professional wrestling, with a standing and body of work that other wrestlers aspire towards. In 2007, however, a still green Cody was barely into his 20s and had the unenviable task of living up to the golden legacies of his legendary father and still active brother. After graduating from WWE's developmental system, Rhodes began traveling with the company's main roster and had a unique experience one night in Louisiana. Anna. During a house show match with Davari, Rhodes suffered an unplanned cut above his eye that needed 19 staples to close. After the show, he rode with Randy Orton and Santino Marella, and it was the Viper that offered Cody some sage veteran advice. Fresh air is good for a cut like that, so stick your head out the window. So, with the vehicle doing 80, Rhodes does his best impression of a car-tripping dog, only for the rush of air to bust three of the staples, resulting in Rhodes bleeding like Dusty would have in a match with Tully Black. Blanchard. Orton and Morella laughed uproariously while Cody the novice learned a valuable lesson. Do not listen to Randy Orton. Number 1. The Desperate Opportunist We began this list with a story of a Canadian wrestling star, a hurricane, and the peripheral involvement of Matt Hardy, and incredibly, we end this video the same way. In 1999, Edge Christian and the Hardy Boys came of age in the WWF, notably with their game-changing ladder match at October's No Mercy pay-per-view in Cleveland. All four men went from talented young mid-carders to undoubted stars of tomorrow as a result of their transcendent high-wire stunt show. What's especially incredible about that bout is that because of circumstances beyond his control, Edge nearly missed the bloody match. Edge and then wife Alana, the sister of Val Venus, were almost stranded in Miami as Hurricane Irene slowly tore through Florida the weekend of No Mercy. The local airports were all shut down, and Edge's only hope was to make it to Tampa many hours away on Sunday morning to catch a last-ditch flight. Miami to Tampa is typically a four-and-a-half-hour drive, but Edge claims he made it in about three thanks to gunning it around 100 miles per hour through a goddamn hurricane! After that white-knuckle ride through rain-slicked highways, the two made it to Tampa at 9.30am, caught the 10am flight to Cleveland, made it to the arena at 4pm, and Edge had the biggest match of his life to that point just mere hours later. As the crowd in Cleveland applauded the four men's efforts, none realized what Edge had been through over the previous day.